everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we were talking to Jim Tam and we we're talking about his book, Radical Collaboration, Five Essential Skills to Overcome Defensiveness and Build Successful Relationships. So welcome, Jim. Thank you, CJ. Good to be here. Um, I am so excited to talk about this idea because it's such a, um, it's, I, I hate to say this, I'm sure you'll maybe find offense, but it's such a buzzword now. Everyone is like, oh, you need to collaborate. Collaboration is so important. Um, what's the genesis of this idea of collaboration? Now it's like, you know, you have to meditate, you have to be mindful, you have to collaborate. <laughs> but what is the real intent behind collaboration? Well, effective collaboration makes everything more effective, period. Mm -hmm. um, if you can't collaborate, it's like uh, not having motor oil in an engine. You know, the parts can wear out, you can keep replacing the parts, but it's not going to run smooth. Right. And, and uh, good collaborative skills can improve the effectiveness of any organization. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we started this back in the late 1980s in the state of California, uh, in a special pilot project funded by the state of California and the Hewlett Foundation when I was a, a judge in California. And um, now it's, uh, it, this was before collaboration was hot. You know? Right. Uh, and the, the first edition of the Radical Collaboration book came out in 2004. Mm -hmm. And then sort of the wave caught up with us at that, you know, maybe 10 years ago or so. And now, af particularly after the, the economic crisis of 2008 and, and those years, uh, organizations in particular, they did as much cutting as they possibly could. Mm. And they, they cut everything to the bone to try and survive. And they realize, well, there's not much more we can do other than try to help people be more effective when mm. they're working together. Mm. And so that's when the wave really started, when the, the term collaboration really became more effective and you know, synonymous with being effective. And then, I mean, the, and with every good business person is going to say, well, prove to me. Jim, prove to me that collaboration is going to have a correlation to our bottom line. Um, sure. How do you, what is the proof now that this is actually a real thing? There's been a lot of research showing that uh, collaborative organizations can outperform more adversarial or passive aggressive organizations or conflict avoidant organizations. The most famous uh, study was done by a couple of, of uh, professors at Harvard. And uh, they looked at the, the impact that a culture has mm -hmm. on the success of a, a corporate uh, world. They, they started with over 200 corporations. They picked mm -hmm. corporations that had clearly defined cultures. Mm -hmm. One was, was they called them enhancing supportive cultures, which is more collaborative. The other is more adversarial or more passive aggressive conflict avoidant cultures. Uh, and the, the more effective we, we call them green zone cultures. Uh, they outperform the, the, the more adversarial and the conflict avoidant, the less collaborative cultures. Their net income uh, was 755% higher in these more collaborative cultures. Their stock price was up over 800 points more. Their revenue was over 500 points more. They increased, uh, they, they built more jobs rather than cut jobs. Uh, just, you know, massive improvements uh, when you compare the collaborative cultures to the non-collaborative mm. cultures. And, and we found the same true when we first started this as a pilot project in California. We were able to reduce the amount of measurable conflict, things like unfair labor practice charges or requests for mediators by almost 70% in over 100 organizations. It saved the state of California just a huge amount of money. So that's why you were hired. The state of California said like, listen, we need to get people out of the courts or what was it that they were trying to well, do? I, I was a judge there for 25 years dealing yeah. with, with uh, conflict in the workplace. Mm. And we kept seeing the same organizations come through our system over and over and over again. Mm. And we're trying to figure out how come some organizations were so conflicted and hostile mm. and some were so collaborative and we never saw them. Mm. So a few of us uh, within the state teamed up. We got a big grant from the Hewlett Foundation. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of research based on that. And then 
with the funding from Hewlett and the state of California, we went out and road tested this, put, put a uh, training program to try to teach the more uh, red zone and these, these conflict avoidant organizations to be more collaborative. Mm -hmm. And we were just you know, wildly successful beyond our dream. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the, the genesis really of, mm -hmm. of uh, what I'm doing today. Okay, so I want to go back um, to just get some more um, clarity on the adversarial kinds of companies that you call in the red zone that yeah. are either passive aggressive or conflict avoidant. For people who aren't familiar with those terms, can you kind of show us or tell us how that would be expressed in, in the courtroom when you came, like the kinds of cases that came up? Sure. Well, in, in, uh, in the courtroom or, or when we would be mediating or doing a settlement conference, you know, you could always tell if somebody were coming in and they had this bad attitude, they wanted to beat the other side, no matter what the expense was, no matter what the cost was, they wanted to win versus solve the problem. Mm. And, you know, and people would get defensive. They wouldn't listen effectively. Uh, they were terrible at problem solving, as opposed to some groups where they would come in, <clears throat> they might still be upset about the problem, but they were trying to solve the problem. They were working on the problem rather than working on each other, mm. trying to win. You know, they were trying mm -hmm. to win their, get their interests met rather than defeat the other side. Mm. And it, it showed up in their, in their language. It showed up in their body language. It showed up in the attitude and the way they would try to create new solutions. It was pretty apparent. You could see what someone's attitude was, the way they behave. Right, that's just aggressive, not even passive aggressive. That's just that's, aggressive, yeah, aggressive. Yeah, generally it was very aggressive. But what we're seeing now is a shift away from the more aggressive, hostile environments to a more conflict avoidant. Mm. Uh, we, we call these hostile environments the red zone. And over the past 10, 15 years, we've, we've heard a lot of comments from people saying, well, we're obviously uh, more collaborative because we don't fight. Oh, you know, there's that's a problem. I just keep my eyes down and my mouth shut, you know? Yeah, it's called and the whole thought, West Coast. <laughs> well, well, they thought that the absence of, of outright warfare meant that they were really good at collaboration. Oh. And that's not the case. They were just talking about being conflict avoidant and more passive aggressive. Oh. Okay. And so what does that look like? Like, oh, we're fine. But well, what, what are the outcomes as a result of being... Um, conflict avoidant like what would that I, like I think all of us can be like oh I think I know defensive listening effectively problem not problem solving I people can be like okay I, I know yeah. those people in my life what would be the descriptors of someone who's conflict avoidant well typically everybody's playing nicey nicey with each other you go into a pink zone meeting and everybody's sitting around going okay mm -hmm, sure mm -hmm, fine and then when they leave the meeting guess what happens yeah. absolutely nothing because nobody's willing to stand up and say hey this is a bad idea you know mm -hmm. we shouldn't waste our time and energy and resources in pursuing this or they don't give constructive feedback because they're afraid of being accused of not being collaborative or being hostile you know mm -hmm. so they just keep their mouth shut mm -hmm. and i find that that these organizations these passive aggressive conflict avoidant organizations are much more difficult to deal with than the more hostile organizations were in the past. Because at least in, the, in these hostile organizations, you can see where the conflict was. Mm. And now everybody's being nice to each other and just nothing's happening. Nobody's getting anything done. So do you think that's as a result of us trying to be politically correct or because we learn collaboration is important and we miss understand that to be conflict avoidant? What, what causes this? I think it's a combination of a bunch of different things. I mean, there are people that realize, oh, well, wow, we're better off if we can collaborate, you know. But I think in an organizational setting, it's been a couple of things. One is um, people used to think if somebody were this, this hostile, hard driven manager, you know, that they were strong and, and effective. Mm. And now they're more likely to be seen as a bully. Mm. And, and organizations are not willing to put up with that in part mm. because employees can sue and mm. they can, and turnover is higher. People just aren't willing to put up with a bully as a boss. Mm. So they've done a much better job of 
reducing the amount of these, you know, red zone hostile uh, environments, but that hasn't necessarily resulted in more collaboration. Mm. Oftentimes it just goes underground. Mm. You know, it's like birding worms. You get them in a circle and then all of a sudden they disappear underground mm. and it looks nicer. So everybody thinks it's a nicer place to work, but they're not accomplishing anything. Uh, I feel like, I mean, I can look at so many different things, whether they're organizations, the government, um, whole cultures, like the West Coast culture feels a lot like this over the course of my lifetime. Uh And it's interesting that it's just, it's a pattern and it's a pattern of, um, I think an evolutionary pattern, you know, you have to like stop being the bully, but then people are hiding it underground and they're kind of finding other more subversive ways of bullying each other, but in yeah. kind of less obvious ways. Um, how do we get, what are the skills that we need to get to the green zone and what is the green zone? Well, this green zone is a more, much more effective collaborative environment and it's part attitudinal and it's part skill-based mm-hmm. uh, where people can work together more effectively. We're, you have an atmosphere that's free of mistrust and, and betrayal and intrigue. So people can deal more directly with the issues as they come up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's a, it tends to be uh, more employee engagement. Mm-hmm. Uh, people tend to be more open. Mm-hmm. Uh, now that doesn't always make things run smoother because if people are more open, they're more willing to raise difficult issues and, and deal with them directly. So that can create a lot of chaos mm-hmm. in an organization, you know, but they seem to be significantly better at, at resolving problems because you can't solve a problem if people aren't willing to talk about it. Mm. And in both the, the more hostile environments or the conflict avoidant environments, people are fearful about being open. So they're mm. not very open. So openness is also a key. Mm. So that's an attitude of openness. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Well, it's both, again, it, it goes back. It's both an attitude and a skill because mm-hmm. there are some ways that you can talk, mm-hmm. uh, you know, present your ideas that will be more open and less threatening to other people. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so that it's both attitude and skill on, on mm-hmm. all of the skills. We, mm-hmm. We've, we've narrowed it down to five key skills that we mm-hmm. feel are essential to, to building more collaborative environments. Mm-hmm. And if, and this is not rocket science. You know, if people put a little bit of energy into it and practice just a little bit, they can implement it almost immediately and it'll have a huge impact on practically any relationship, whether it's business oriented, which is where we spend most of our time or whether it's interpersonal. Hmm. Okay, what are the five skills? Please reveal. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the first one uh, we call collaborative intention and that's more the mindset. And the key skill there is having the ability to stay focused on mutual gains in your relationship when you hit one of those speed bumps mm-hmm. in the road. You know, when, when somebody makes a mistake or does something that you don't understand, mm-hmm. can, you, can you keep a collaborative mindset and get curious or do you go furious? You know, do you go into the red zone and become <laughs> furious about it? You know? right. Curious versus furious. You know? Right. So that's the first skill. Yes, got it. The second it. skill is openness, creating an open environment there. And that's, there's been a lot of research done recently showing how important that is, particularly uh, some research by Google. Mm-hmm. You know, Google is, is the most data-driven company you can think of. Mm-hmm. And they were trying to figure out what's the difference between their effective teams, high-performing teams, and low-performing teams. Mm-hmm. So they spent a two-year period studying 180 of their own teams, everything that you could think about. Mm. You know, if you could think it up and there was a way of measuring it, they measured it. They right. looked at gender uh, differences, balance, uh, age balance, experience levels. Uh, they looked at things like whether the employees on a team went out to lunch together, how much mm. did they socialize. Mm. And after a couple of years of study, they realized that most of the things they looked at they could do just as good a job picking a, a, a team by throwing a dart at a dartboard. I mean, it just had no impact. Mm. But there was one thing more than anything else, high above anything else, that had a, a direct influence on the effectiveness of the team. 
And that was the level, they called it the, the level of psychological safety, which hmm. is basically having this green zone environment, a collaborative environment where people can say what's on their mind without fear of getting punished for it, you know, where they can raise difficult issues and deal with hmm. them directly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you can increase the level of openness within any organization or, or generally any relationship, it's going to have a dramatic improvement on the effectiveness of that relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So that's the second one, openness. Yep. It's an attitude as well as, and that's harder said than done, like creating psychological safety. Like what specifically, I, I, what I want to do in the second segment um, mm -hmm. is to talk a little bit about the hows. Like how do you set up, I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of examples that I hear from okay. my clients and I'd love to run you through. Um, some scenarios in the second segment, but okay. okay. So level of second um, openness. What's the third one? Uh, self accountability, mm -hmm. and this is helping people get a better understanding of what their own belief system is about how much choice they have in life. A lot of times, people are feeling powerless. You know mm -hmm. that they don't have a choice. They're stuck in a bad marriage. They're stuck in a bad job, mm -hmm. and they don't think they have a choice. Well, mm -hmm. it is a choice to stay in a bad marriage. Yeah, it may, it may be a difficult choice. You got kids or, you know, you have to make a living or whatever, you know, so you stay in a bad job. Mm -hmm. But that is a choice. And so if we can get people to uh, take a deeper look at their own belief system about how much choice they have in their life, and then increase that just even just a little bit, that can be very empowering for both mm -hmm. the organization and for the individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that the, I mean, how I see that as a life coach is that people aren't generally authentically expressing who they are. And so they are following what they're following, like, oh, that person got promoted. So I'll just be like that person. Well, you're nothing like that person. Why not get clear with who you are and get promoted based on those skills? But you're presuming that you're making, you're having a belief and you are making a choice that. I'm just going to follow the pattern of people who have been successful, yeah. but really the strategy that they're using is authentically being themselves and using their gifts. It's, it's interesting. I, I, yeah. You typically have much more power when you're coming from your own center, as you know, right? Than, yeah. than if you're trying to emulate somebody else or copy somebody yeah. else. Yeah. That seems to be the ultimate in, in self, like yourself yeah. accountability. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Got. So that's the third one. How about the other two? Uh, the fourth one we call self-awareness, and it's p mm. paying particular attention to your own defensiveness. Because if you're trying to build a more collaborative environment or a stronger relationship or solve problems, and you start getting defensive, it's like pouring blood and water to a shark. <laughs> it's going to create a feeding frenzy there, and it will just destroy relationships. And so uh, defensiveness is such a key issue to this that we spend a huge amount of time helping people deal with their own defensiveness. Uh, and because that's the key, you know, people oftentimes would come into the workshops thinking, well, I, I want to deal with defensiveness and the way I'll deal with it is by making other people stop being defensive. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't work that way. You know, you got to deal with your own defensiveness. So, right. We try to help people get a better idea of what defensiveness is about, help them spot it sooner rather than later before they're in trouble, uh, and then come up with some action plans that they can, you know, help okay. moderate the damage. That's going to be section three, okay? Because okay. I really, I have a whole yeah. bunch of questions that, around that. Quite, quite, quite frankly, that's the thing. If, if they can do a better job of managing their own defensiveness. That's the thing that will give us, give them the biggest improvement in the shortest period of time, mm. the biggest bang for their buck, mm. just dealing with that one issue more than anything else. Right. I, I really love that. Okay. So maybe we'll make that segment too, but we're going to talk about it. Okay. okay. <laughs> Did we hit all three of them? There's, um, and, and then there's yeah. one, there's, there's one more skill and that's negotiating and problem solving because okay. It, you know, if you're in a long-term relationship, you're bound to have some conflict, especially if you're talking about working relationships. Mm -hmm. If you don't have any conflict in a working relationship, it's probably not as productive a relationship mm -hmm. as it could be. Mm -hmm. you know, either that or you're just not paying attention or 
overly medicated or in complete denial or whatever, you know. There, mm -hmm. uh, so the key is to be able to deal with that conflict in a way that supports the relationship rather than undermines it. Because mm. anybody can go into a negotiation with a scorched earth attitude and, you know, and just blow the whole thing up. But if you can deal with the difficult issues in a way that, that support the relationship and, and build on that, uh, then that makes a huge difference over time because there will be conflict there. Okay, got it. All right. So I love these. Um, I love these skills. Well, let's in the second segment and, and third, let's actually put I'm going to give you some real life scenarios of which I've heard my clients talk about all the time. So um, and we'll figure out how you can actually be more collaborative. Um, we have been talking to um, Jim Tam and he we've been talking about his book, right, the second edition of this book, Radical Collaboration, Five Essential Skills to Overcome defensiveness and build successful relationships. Thank you so much.